The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. So this episode is the 100th episode of the Cannabis Conversation, which is pretty crazy. A very proud achievement for me. I didn't really think I'd get much past 10 or 20 episodes. So great to still be going at 100 and and even greater that I'm still really enjoying it. And there's lots more to explore. So yeah, thank you for all your kind support along the way and for tuning in on this episode. As it's a special episode, I was umming and ahhing about who I'd get on. And, you know, I was speaking to Mike Tyson and Joe Rogan and I had them limed up. But I was speaking to my good friend Tom Gray from Lumino, who's uh, formerly of Bloom Jobs. And Tom said, you know what, Anoush, how about I interview you as a retrospective? And I said, that's a fantastic idea, Tom. So I called up Mike and I called up Joe and I said, listen, guys, I need you to stand down. And they said, listen, can we just be assistants on the show? And I said, no, 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 guys. This is all about Tom and me. <laughs> so here we are. Tom, welcome. Thank you very much, Anish. Well, I'm I'm sorry in advance to Joe Rogan and Mike Tyson, though. Obviously, I pipped them to the post on that one. But it is a, a huge honor to be here for the 100th episode. I'm pretty sure I've, I've listened to most of them. So, so thank you for, for having me here. And it's, it's a yeah, real pleasure. Uh, likewise, Tom, I really appreciate it. And I thank you for suggesting the idea. It's really, it's a good one. It's going to feel a bit weird, but, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll get over it. (laughs) But before we kick (laughs) off, and look, I'll hand the reins over to you. Before we do that, maybe, I know you've been on the show previously, but it was very early doors. So maybe you can remind everyone who you are and what you're up to. Sure. So very briefly, name's Thomas Gray. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Lumino, formerly known as Bloom Jobs. And we're a exclusive cannabis industry recruitment consultancy. So we built in the cannabis industry in Europe, and we serve the industry in Europe across plant touching, medical and ancillary functions. And we're a growing team in, a, in an exciting growing industry. And that is that is us in a nutshell. Without stealing the show, Anoush, we all want to hear about you <laughs> and uh, all of the opportunities you've given to for people to share their stories. And I think a lot of people want to know your story and your background and how you came to get involved in, in this industry. How, I mean, what was life before the podcast, Anoush? Well, thank you, Tom. So, you know, as I'm sure you've heard me mention a number of times on the show, I am a lawyer by background and many a media lawyer for the last 15 years, working in film and television. So along the way, I worked for Gordon Ramsay for a bit, which was uh, quite an experience, but also, uh, you know, worked in film as well. So I got to go to sort of lots of premieres in Leicester Square and that was all quite enjoyable at the time. But I think in media or certainly where I was, most of the roads lead to sort of big corporates like the movie studios and Sky. And I wasn't really interested in that longer term. You know, for me, I think big corporates and just my experience of them, they turn into sort of micro societies and, you know, senior management are a bit more like politicians than managers with their constituents being their departments, you know, and I found that it it became a lot about internal PR and politics and power struggles and stuff. And it wasn't anything that looked very appealing to me. And so I wasn't keen on climbing the greasy pole in, in, in a massive organisation like, uh, like the ones I was working with. The best role I had through my time was at a company called Blinkbox, which it was a movie streaming service. And, you know, it was always going to struggle, really, because it's pretty hard to compete with people like Apple and Netflix. But uh, the reason I really liked that role was that I got to work with the founders really closely. You know, I was group head of legal, so I was a lawyer, but I sort of pitched to the to the founders that I wanted to basically become more of a commercial director and they, they really liked that. And so they, um, you know, being natural entrepreneurs and, and sort of encouraging in that way were sort of helping me develop in, in those sort of areas, which was great. And I loved the entrepreneur mentality. You know, they were comfortable with taking risks and making mistakes and it was just really, really refreshing but unfortunately, you know, all good things come to an end. We got acquired by Talk Talk uh, at one point and um, I stuck it out for about 15 months. And, you know, I really wanted to get out. I was in a bit of a kind of low confidence period because I was going for jobs I didn't want because I was desperate to get out. I wasn't getting them because clearly the companies realised I didn't want them. And 
And so it's the cycle was continuing. So one day I just sort of woke up and decided to quit with nothing to go to. Thankfully had the blessing of my wonderfully patient wife and went freelance. And, uh, you know, along the way, I just worked with a number of different sort of early stage companies and kissed a lot of frogs, tried out various things, including starting a uh, fitness business with a friend, which was a great experience. All of it said to me, startups and early stage businesses is where I wanted to focus. And at the end of 2017, I kind of found cannabis and uh, Gavin Sethi Nathan, who's a, been a, been on the show a couple of times, he and I used to work together at Blinkbox. He, I bumped into him and he said, come along to Cannabis Europa in 2018 in, in the Barbican. You were there, weren't you, Tom, I think? Yeah, I was. I do. That, that was my first foray in, into the industry as well. Absolutely ah, no idea okay, what to expect. Cool. <laughs> well, exactly that. Yes. That was the same. I wasn't sure what to expect. And, you know, there were, was it going to be loads of hippies? Was it going to be very, very corporate? It was, I guess, somewhere in between. But what really blew me away was the patient talks that I, that I saw. And, you know, they were nothing that resembled the cliched stoners that I'd associated with cannabis. And it was kind of really heartbreaking to see how people were struggling to get medicine that was really helping them or their, their loved ones. So, it felt like an area that could really have a positive influence on the world, which is actually really what I was looking for in, in life away from big companies. And, and also, you know, I was drawn to the challenge of kind of overcoming the stigma that cannabis has and, and then the obvious inevitable huge opportunity that this sort of emerging industry offers. And, you know, at a high level, cannabis obviously has huge medical potential, great sustainability credentials in, in hemp. And I think that's particularly underdeveloped area. And longer term, you know, I think cannabis can be a better alternative to alcohol on the kind of recreational side. So let's see. But, you know, it ticks a lot of boxes for me. So that was a long winded answer. <laughs> really interesting. And now I, I, I do remember cannabis Europe as the, the sort of melting pot of quite a lot of people, I think, that we see in the industry around us, particularly that that first one where we all sort of met and, and, and came together. and. As you said, it's hard to know what to expect going into those events, particularly, I mean, I was coming from financial services as well, you know, corporate background and, and going to a, a cannabis industry event at the Barbican that did look very professional. And it it was obviously a lot more professional than you're expecting, but it is, a, it is a bit of a shock to the system and that sort of thing, explaining to your parents that it's not just stoners and it's sensible. And uh, that was that was definitely an interesting one trying to convey what cannabis Europa was like on, on the ground. But no, Absolutely. And being a very much consider you an entrepreneur yourself. I mean, you've built this fantastic podcast, which is an amazing resource. I mean, I think it's the most listened to cannabis podcast in Europe. Am I right in saying that? As far as I'm aware, can we say that? Let's go with that. <laughs> I, 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 I certainly most listened to by me and uh, and the people I speak with. But what sort of brought you to to come up with the idea of doing a podcast in the first place? Like, yes, you're an entrepreneur. Yes, you were looking for, to sort of break away from the the corporate surroundings. Where did the idea of a podcast come from? Yeah, I, look, I, I was really excited about cannabis when I when my eyes were opened at, at Cannabis Europa, and then I was reading lots of reports, starting to understand what was happening in North America. But I didn't really have a, any idea where to start, so I was actually searching for podcasts myself to sort of learn a bit more. And they were all North American, and Canner Insider was the one that I was listening to, which was great. Really interesting, but, you know, not necessarily that relevant or all of it to what was happening here. So I just decided to start my own because no one was really doing that in Europe at the time. There's quite a few now, but I figured it was a good way to just gain knowledge, meet interesting people and build a network. And, you know, it's provided all those things for me. And I think, it, you know, a lot of getting involved in the cannabis industry is, is sort of mirrored in lots of personal development things that I'm doing too. And it was very scary to begin with. I've never done any public performance before. I wasn't in a band at school or anything like that. So this was very weird, but I figured it was worth the plunge. And uh, I've said it, I've said it quite a few times, but it's the first thing I've ever done with no outcome in mind. And, and that's extremely liberating because you just aren't burdened with expectations, right? There's no specific place that you need to get to and that you get fixated on. So you can take it in different directions. And I, I quite like that. And you know what? I get a few messages a week from different people from all around the world who are saying that they enjoy the show and that they've learned lots from it. So that gives me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. But genuinely, look. What is the most sort of common feedback you get from your listeners, just out of curiosity? It's kind of, yeah, the learning bit, I think. Lots of people to just like say thank you. It's really helped me in sort of figuring out more about the industry. I've got, I got a really good one about six months ago where 
from a guy that had he'd actually quit his job to find a job in the cannabis industry and he sort of credited uh, the podcast with inspiring him to do that so i mean it's it's a huge amount of satisfaction when you hear things like that very very pleased when i get those sort of messages amazing any any surprises along the way i mean i guess you went into it with not knowing what to expect in mind but anything that you really weren't expecting on your journey to 100 podcasts (laughs) uh surprising i guess just the variety of people i speak to i you know the first 10 episodes were a bit kind of 101 you know and actually i I, initially i wanted to teach the whole world about cannabis but very quickly it became apparent that the podcast was more of an industry focused podcast and and actually quite like that so you know it goes back to the point i was saying uh, without being kind of fixated on an on an outcome meant that I could really easily sort of move over to that focus. But but the first 10 episodes were sort of a 101 on what is cannabis and CBD and THC and the, the law and things like that. And then I just assumed that I'd be interviewing a succession of CBD brands, you know, of which there are many. But the, the reality is there are just so many angles and, and, and each week I kind of learn about more. And, and so I feel like I could keep going for quite a while because there's so many interesting people to speak to. And there's constant new entrants into the market as well, doing different things. So, uh, yeah, I guess that was the breadth of, of things to cover is, is the, probably the biggest surprise. No, of course. And that means you've at least had a hundred really interesting conversations in the industry, which I, again, more than some people can say, which I, I think at the center of all of these conversations, having a chance to speak to all these professionals, certainly just listening to it, you can pick up a huge amount of information, really understand sort of what's going on in the industry, but you're literally the person having all of those conversations. And through the course of them, is there any sort of key takeaways that you've learned over, over the course of them? Yeah, look, I mean, I've learned some very practical things like uh, things about sound recording and sound editing and social media marketing and, and all those sort of bits. But I guess the key one was to learn to turn off the mute button on my, on my mic. So I bought a, a Blue Yeti mic, which anyone that's sort of familiar with this sort of stuff is quite a, it's a well-rated kind of go-to entry level mic that most amateur podcasters use. Uh, and so I bought this swanky new mic and I traveled to meet people with my laptop to record. And I was really nervous about the tech side of things. And I recorded these first three episodes. And then when I came to edit them, the sound was terrible. And I, I just figured out that I'd had the mute button on the whole time. So it was being recorded through my laptop mic, which is terrible. And so it basically sounds like we're underwater for those three. (laughs) But what that actually taught me was it taught me that perfection is the enemy of progress. That's my current favorite phrase, because you know what, you just kind of need to get on with it sometimes. And, and things are never really going to be perfect. You're always learning. And I, I always feel like I'm improving. I don't think I'm the best podcaster in the world, but I don't think I'm the worst either. And, and I do feel like I'm improving. So that's the bit I focus on. So, you know, that if that from a kind of personal development perspective has been a, a major learning. In terms of the specific topic areas, I feel, wow, in the last two years since I've been doing this, it's a bit like an MBA. I've just learned so much about how businesses work and how the world works. It's some topics, it's things like cultivation, but supply chains, public markets, private investment, venture capital, drug development processes, farmer industry consumer packaged goods, you know, there's probably another 20 I could name. So yeah, huge breadth of, of areas. Amazing. I mean, that it's certainly a, a very dynamic industry. And I guess speaking to each corner of that has really opened, opened your mindset. And I, I also especially like the, the idea that perfection is, is the enemy of progress. I think that's a, like a really useful attitude to have in such an early stage industry where I think when people start thinking they're the experts, they get, they get overtaken. So it's nice to see that like it's helped shape your mentality in the way that you do things as well. I guess my next question would be, any particular memorable moments? I know there's lots of them having listened to laughed at, at a lot of your podcasts and, and found them really obviously interesting. Uh, but from your perspective, what are your, your, some of your favorite moments that you've had? Yeah, look, so the first episode, as I said, is, was, was with George um, McBride. And as I mentioned, I was very nervous. So it, it felt quite scripted. I stuck slavishly to the, to the script that I've written because I didn't really know what I was doing. But George is great though. You know, he's a very, accomplished public speaker so he's probably the perfect person to have as the first guest and he's got such a loud voice that he doesn't really need a mic so the mic issue was less of a problem and look he he filled us in on a bit of history on prohibition so it was a great way to kick things off then I guess still a relatively early one was I interviewed George Cruz and Dominic Day who were uh, 
to international rugby players. And again, it was early days, so it felt weird. I mean, this was a completely amateur project, an armchair podcaster. And I was in the room with two international rugby players talking about their CBD brand. And again, it, it just felt really weird that it happened quite quickly. And quite apart from anything else, they, they're comedy big people. Like, I'm probably the size of George Cruz's leg. They were giants. And uh, so I've got some funny pictures from the day of them flanked either side of me. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. It's a good reminder for me to get them back on, actually. That's, I actually particularly remember that one. Uh, I remember laughing at that one. I think you're going to hate me for bringing it up, but I think they're ripping on you for for your hair or something along those yeah. lines. <laughs> yeah, or, or lack of, or lack of, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, they're, ru- yeah. they're rugby lads, aren't they? So they're going to be a yeah, little bit yeah. um, piss-taking, let's say. Good guys, actually, really like them. I, look, I, I wouldn't be able to talk about this without mentioning uh, Professor Raphael Mishulim as well. I mean, a huge honour and a privilege but I was, I was also very, very nervous for that one. But I'd, I'd got a few more episodes under my belt, so it was a bit easier. But, you know, such a legend and still inspirational that he's still going at 90. So, yeah, it was, yeah, that was, that was big. And then uh, Steve D'Angelo was a really interesting one, mainly because of the time I recorded it. It was right at the beginning of the first lockdown. So I'm going to say March 2020. And he'd just done a little video. It was as much about psychedelics as it was about cannabis, but talking about it from a, what we were going through on a, on a very spiritual level. And so the episode was, it felt quite spiritual as well. And he's a long time activist. So I had, you know, huge amounts to talk about. Really interesting guy. And then I guess, you know, the doctors. So Dr. Ethan Russo, I got to record a couple of episodes with and and Dr. Rachel Knox did a brilliant description of the endocannabinoid system and which I really enjoyed and actually that's the the most popular episode on YouTube so you know clearly others agree as well amazing that is really cool I do particularly like the ones where they take a deep dive into the science I mean personally I'm not a scientist by by trade by any stretch but it is interesting to learn how much we have to learn if you like about it and i guess again why podcasts come in useful for a lot of people but on that topic and and what's interesting and from your perspective running the show are there any particular topics that you've found to be of personal interest to you that you want to further explore or areas that you've really stuck to or, or want to dig into yeah well similar to you tom i really like the science ones and mainly because it, it's a real, real opportunity to learn and there's that kind of ob- objectivity to it. But I think, you know, I think if we want this industry to be respected, that's the kind of language we need to speak in. And so I really, I love speaking to the scientists and the researchers. You know, there's lots of passionate advocates in the space, but I, you know, sometimes they can be a bit too exuberant and maybe a bit blinkered about the wonderful benefits of cannabis and you can tell that scientists are really excited that they've got a new box of toys to play with. And that I find really appealing, but they also give you a really grounded insight just into exactly where we are and how much work there is still to do to sort of convince people. So, you know, that's, that's probably the science bracket is, is a big one. And then again, you know, entrepreneurs basically, and that's kind of the main bit that I, that I really enjoy. Lots of people who are trying to solve problems and how they're going about it. And so I love hearing those stories. You know, as this kind of all matures a bit, you know, the the talent pool is increasing and and there's this better quality people coming in with better quality ideas and and more ideas on how to execute them. And so, yeah, that those shows are great. Lots of different angles as well. So yeah, those are the two main areas. Awesome. And on that point of entrepreneurs, again, consider you as an entrepreneur, any advice to entrepreneurs that are looking to get involved in the industry and and maybe some nuggets of wisdom you could share? So my advice for entrepreneurs, really good question. I think focus is key. Lots of people trying to do lots of different things. You know, my, I've been totally guilty of this myself and everyone seems to have three or five projects that they're into. And I think, you know, as an entrepreneur and certainly most investors really want to see that you're committed to what they're putting their money and effort into. And so you, I think you need to choose one, maybe two things that you want to go large on and, and try and focus on delivering those. I think you're yeah, focusing a bit more on the long term. The kind of GameStop, get rich quick type moment has has gone. And I think you need to build something with a bit more of a firmer foundations if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur in space, actually. Differentiation, I'll probably mention it a few times on the show, but you know, the kind of me too bit is also probably 
a bit over now. The novelty of just having a CBD brand is, you know, it needs to be a bit different now. So think about different ways you can solve problems from other people in the market. And then I guess my genuine sort of personal care advice is be kind to yourself. You know, you'll make mistakes. Everyone does. And we all are continually, particularly during this sort of COVID time, you know, people are dropping balls all over the shop because it's just, we're really time constrained. So be kind to yourself. I mean, I, I was really lucky. One of the best managers I have had in my time very early on, he said, listen, I'll, I'll back you wherever happens, but need you to own your mistakes, take responsibility from them, learn from them and move on quickly. And it's been great advice. And so, you know, I, I know that I will make mistakes, but, you know, I take them on board and I try not to get down in the dumps about them for too long and, and sort of move on. And I think it's, it's crucial because there'll be lots of bumps along the road. Amazing. That was really good. I'm going to write those down for me because that is really <laughs> good advice. Thank you for that. Brilliant. So in regards to exploring all these different angles of the industry, and obviously there's a lot of question marks over the industry as a whole because it's early stage and it's just coming around but are there any particular large question marks or, or topic areas that you want to shed light on in your next episodes or things that you want to maybe dive in a little deeper yeah yeah there's loads i'd really like to to interview a policeman or a policewoman or indeed a politician i'd like to sort of cover those those angles biosynthesis is an interesting one i just posted something today which causes a lot of debate so yeah biosynthesis of cannabinoids Seed genetics is a really interesting area as well. I think we haven't really covered that one on the show. AI is something that is something that keeps on coming up, particularly in relation to pre-clinical trials. And yeah, I'd love to talk to people who are sort of in that space. And then cannabis testing. Like, there's quite a few different tests involved in cannabis in relation to like potency and heavy metals and those sort of things. It'd be good to sort of talk about all of the, the various testing regimes that are involved. So those are just some of the topics that I've been thinking about. I want to cover more of. Super interesting. I I think I did see your post day on on yeast synthesis. Was it in uh, growing CBD in in test tubes? And it just like that. So many really fascinating areas that are literally just coming around now, and nobody necessarily is sort of pinned down what's going to be happening. But I'd very much love to listen to some podcasts on that. Yeah, if you can. That'd well, really I'll try and make it happen. <laughs> Good. Well, I really couldn't be on this podcast without asking you this next question. And it's one that you ask pretty much everyone that comes on your show. But what do your parents say about what you do now? <laughs> well, they don't speak to me anymore. No, I'm joking. Uh, uh, well, they, they studiously ignore it, actually. So I had the conversation with them when I first started it. I told them what I was doing. And they kind of looked at me really weirdly and said, I'm sure, I'm sure you know what you're doing. And I said, yes, don't worry about it. And it has never been mentioned since, which is quite cute. You know, they're, they're still obviously very encouraging for me in general, but I think it serves everyone's benefit that we don't have these really awkward chats about cannabis. I think it would just weird me out. So yeah, sorry, it's not as interesting as, as some of the answers, but, <laughs> but yeah. In terms of everything that's been going on in recent times, it's been a manic couple of years for so many different reasons, but 2021 is it going to be a new year? Where do you see the industry going this year? Wow, that's huge. So look, I think in the US, and we have to look at the US because it's you know by far the biggest market and is where all the noise is. The designation of cannabis as an essential service during COVID is, is obviously a very big vote of legitimacy. And, you know, all of the states that had cannabis on the ballot in November, cannabis was a clear winner. The blue wave with the new administration is hopefully going to bring some stability and maybe some more institutional money. And then New York is looking, you know, obviously to to change up its laws in relation to cannabis and follow New Jersey. So again, you know, I think is it the second or third biggest state in the US. It will, that will be another big thumbs up for cannabis in the US. And, it will, you know, inevitably the whole world will, will take notice of that. On the international front, you know, we had Kenzie on at the end of last year to, to sort of talk about the UN decision. And again, a, a finally a, a sort of international acknowledgement of the medical utility of cannabis. So quite significant. Uh, the GW Pharma deal, which was just announced a couple of weeks ago, and another big uh, vote of legitimacy with a big kind of multi-billion dollar corporate deal. And what's significant about the GW deal, I think, is, is a real focus on IP. So it remains to be seen how 
much of a bearing it has on a lot of the other companies in the space. But yeah, big news and keeps everyone talking about it, which is good. Mexico and Israel on track for legalization, which would be massive and just would provide more case studies for other countries who are looking at changing their laws, I think, just on ways to do it and, and ways to regulate. Got the merger of Tilray and Afria. And, you know, I think you'll probably see a bit more consolidation around similar sort of businesses. And in terms of sectors, you know, infused beverages, everyone seems to be getting quite excited about it. And I, I get it. I think if you can get the technology right and it gets into your system quick enough and has enough bioavailability, then it will open up new demographics to cannabinoids, well, particularly in North America, but across the rest of the world. And then, you know, more development of the other cannabinoids, you know, CBG and CBM where it's allowed, will also develop further, I think. And then, you know, bringing it back closer to home Europe, we've got novel foods, the novel food regulations, the impact of which will start in March and away at the end of March. I speak to lots of different people about this and no one really knows. There's there's no real general consensus on what might happen. I think it's different things that different people want to happen, but you know, it'll be it'll be interesting how that pans out. And then finally I got we've got the new listings in, in London for certain cannabis stocks and there's gonna be quite a few to follow by the sounds of it. So that will open up some money markets for for those businesses and, and the the industry in general. Amazing. Really amazing. I mean that's why when we hang out I ask you for your perspective on the industry. It's like the weather for what's going on in cannabis. Brilliant. <laughs> and bring it home a little bit. And I mean, I guess it's hard to escape home these days, literally, because we're locked in. But what's this year meant for you and, and last year with this whole corona? How have you managed to adapt? I know you, you've been uh, settling in your full-time teacher, dad, podcaster, entrepreneur slash lawyer position since lockdown. But what, what's that mean in practice for you? <laughs> well, you've probably heard me whinging about homeschooling a bit on this show, but look, it's been incredibly challenging this year. It's really, it's really dragging and everyone has sort of different issues with it. But yeah, look, uh, hopefully we're, things are going to be opening up soon and, and that will be a change, but it's it, lots of uncertainty and it, it has been tough for everyone in different ways. I tried a few things out and they haven't worked out for one reason or another. And you know what, they're really frustrating experiences at the time, but very, very valuable in hindsight. They've really helped me to sort of refine my radar on the type of people I want to work with and the things I want to do. I think I probably had a bit of imposter syndrome and, you know, what the hell do I know about cannabis? But actually, what the hell does anyone know about cannabis? This is all so new. And in fact, I think if you don't have a little bit of imposter syndrome, you're probably a bit too overconfident and cocky. So I have kind of embraced that bit. But uh, it, what it made me do was focus on where I can really add some value and and so the obvious way is to sort of open up my services as a lawyer, as a commercial lawyer to businesses in the space. And and so now I've got about seven or eight cannabis and CBD clients in Canada, in the UK, including people like Materia. So Deepak, Michael and Nick, who I've had on the show before, and then Three Dots and Neo Kuma. So Sean McClintock, who was on the show fairly recently as well. And then I very excitingly have just signed with a leading US MSO. So yeah. That's very exciting. But look, generally where I've come out with all of this stuff is that I'm I'm really passionate about building a better quality industry through some of my experiences. And so on one hand, I think the podcast is really helping that endeavor on the education side of things. But also, you know, along the way, I've learned a few things about cannabis and I've built a great network of people. So I'm basically looking to connect good people with other good people. And so I've I've rebranded my consultancy practice to Canverse, that's C-A-N-V-E-R-S-E, com, like Converse, but with an A. And you guys have just gone through a rebrand, so you you understand how fun that experience is. Yeah, it's really, really fun. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so glad and thrilled that it's done. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I... Yeah, well, congratulations for you for getting for getting that done. It looks brilliant. Yeah, thank you. And it's basically it's a it's a commercial legal consultancy, you know, looking to help companies in this space. So, the legal services uh, I offer in in partnership with a company called Legal Edge. And what's great about them they they're not a law firm, but we provide growth startup and scale up companies uh, with a go to in house lawyer. And it's great to be part of that family because it means that I've got great backup and we've got over 20 senior lawyers that can help me on a range of commercial services like fundraising, investments, shareholder stuff and commercial deals, data and brand protection, employment, all the sort of fun day-to-day -day legal needs that you might have. But yeah, and you know, that's kind of 
be, be the obvious side of things on the commercial side of things i'm working with a few startups to help them with their sort of fundraising strategy working with a north american company looking for partners in europe and and working with a medical cannabis company looking at sort of strategic acquisitions so that's quite varied the commercial bit and again it's just sort of plugging in the great conversations that I have with people across the world about what they're doing and and hopefully I can act as a filter so helping connect to trustworthy people with other trustworthy people is the hope amazing amazing and, and obviously given your network there's a really wide pool of companies that you can work for and work with but what sort of draw drew you if you like to some of the projects that you're working with today what, what do you find interesting about those I'm always open to sort of working with new people in sort of different ways. So, and then that kind of makes it fun being quite open to lots of different things. But I think everyone in this space can identify with having some experience of bad actors. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm being generous, I think there are so many exciting areas in cannabis that people are sort of rushing in and, and wanting to do lots of things and probably not focused and, and maybe end up wasting people's time. If I'm being less generous, I think there are some really short term people who are looking to get rich quick, probably lulled in by soaring Canadian stocks. You know, the reality is it's just a lot harder than that. And, you know, like in any industry, you sort of need to be longer term in your approach to some of the things I mentioned earlier. So I'm I'm looking to help the good guys win and I'm looking for people who aren't in it just for the money. Don't get me wrong, we all want to be successful, but there has to be a bit more to it and a real purpose to what you want to do. I'm really lucky to meet people like you, Tom, who are sort of doing things for the right reasons and, you know, want to build successful commercial businesses, but with a with a positive purpose. So those are the type of people I'm looking to help. And on the startup side, I'm looking to speak to people who are being innovative. Again, differentiation I mentioned earlier. If you're looking to do things in a slightly different way from your competitors, that's certainly something I'm looking to help with. And then sustainability and diversity and more progressive ways of doing things so it doesn't have to be at the core of what you do but you need to be mindful of that in the way that you approach your business and yeah i want to build a help build a positive cannabis industry that serves as an example to all industries and so promoting people that sort of doing that is key also looking to work with sort of you know more established north american companies who are looking at navigating the european scene and then as always always looking to speak to, to new investors who are interested in the space. Brilliant. I, I know you've built up quite a network of investors and quite a lot of listeners as well, that investors. So that must be useful, complementary to the way you work. In regards to uh, Legal Edge, you mentioned earlier, what does that mean really for sort of cannabis businesses? So let's say some of the large North American companies coming in or maybe some of the smaller companies that are just going through seed funding or first round investment, what sort of services are, are, are being offered there? So we offer commercial in-house legal services rather than regulatory type activities. There are, there are firms that do that. And I think not wanting to kind of sound too competitive, but law, law firms are great for a number of things, but they can work out really expensive. And I, the reason I was drawn to Legal Edge is as a, an in-house lawyer throughout my career, I think if you're working in-house, you're working in a business, you have a slightly more commercial approach than a, a kind of hands-off law firm. And I think that's what's needed. So it means you kind of get things done a bit quicker. And we're, I think we're a bit more reasonable on cost. And a lot of the lawyers in the team are, are actually entrepreneurs themselves. So they really understand the, the pressures that early stage businesses are, are under. And so, you know, hopefully we can help with all those commercial and corporate legal services that a lot of early stage businesses need, but possibly can't afford the big law firms. Brilliant. Awesome. Really good to know. In in regards to something you mentioned slightly just just before around obviously lots of different people in the industry for different reasons. Some really here to build a value driven, positive net positive industry, and some people just to get rich quick or cowboys, as sometimes they're often referred to in the industry. Any tips for spotting a cowboy? I feel like that's a pretty valuable tool when you're involved in in the early stage of any sort of exciting market. What are your tips for? avoiding cowboys and and sort of staying focused, I guess. I mean, LinkedIn is a really good resource at the very top of things, just sort of a bit of basic due diligence. Ask them lots of questions. I mean, you'll be amazed at some of the answers you hear. I mean, you you are in the perfect place to answer this question. You speak to so many people, you know, you can really easily, when you kind of ask them a few questions and prod them a bit, they're not even sure what the difference between THC and CBD is. 
I think it's moved on a bit since those Cowboys, but still, you know, there are massive blind spots that people have and they kind of gloss over the bits that they don't know rather than just being honest about them. And so, yeah, I think those two are, are pretty big ways to sort of find out. And then I guess, again, you ask them about the number of projects they're working on. And sometimes people can have advisory roles and maybe one big main thing, but, you know, that will also give you a bit of uh, some clues to, to whether they'll be able to focus on the thing that you want them to. That's a really good one. So if people are doing 800 different projects, they're probably trying to shoot too many hairs. Good. I think so. Good advice. And for you, obviously, pushing towards a, an industry which is valuable for everyone, as we said, a net positive industry, but what... Is there an overarching business philosophy that you work with or a vision that you could sort of uh, distill it down to the way that you, you operate and, and what you're pushing for? Good question. Look, I'm not going to pretend to be Alan Sugar or anything. And for those non-UK people, Alan Sugar is the presenter of The Apprentice in the UK. You know, that's the kind of model I don't want to be actually, you know, the idea that to be successful in business, you've got to be aggressive and cutthroat. I don't think that's a key to business success. It might work for some people, but it's not something that I want to be associated with and I don't think it's necessary. All of my business philosophy really centers around people and collaboration and effective collaboration. You can't do it all on your own. And I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I don't think for me to win, someone else has to lose. Um, I think it's very possible for us all to succeed together and achieve more actually together. That's my belief. So I think collaboration is key, but good collaboration needs trust. And that's where I feel like I can help as well. You know, I think there can be a lack of trust in this space, either through past experiences or just the fact that there's so many new entrants and there's so many new pieces of technology. It's quite hard to get your head around all of it. So I hope that I can help navigate that path on behalf of people. But to, to really engender that trust, I think leaders need a kind of clear vision. And that applies to all the people that they're dealing with. So it's, you know, in the very obvious case, it's, leadership gets applied to your employees or your staff but it should also you know you want to be inspiring trust in investors and your customers and your suppliers all important stakeholders in your success and if, if you really do manage to inspire them then they're going to really go to bat for you and, and and really help in ensuring that you become a success so when I was looking at the idea of you know leadership I actually posted something on LinkedIn the other day around what motivates employees and Surprise, surprise, it's not money. I think money can help in really very functional tasks, uh, mechanical tasks, but anything that involves cognitive ability, it isn't money. And actually, I think money can be a kind of negative incentive in some ways. The three that they came up with, three areas, were autonomy, so being responsible for what you do, mastery, improving at what you do, and purpose, why you're doing what you do. So that's the Simon Sinek why and so, you know, I, I really want to work with inspiring leaders. I think that is the key to, to, to all of this, not just to inspire their employees, but all, all collaborators. Sound financials and things like that are, are very important. You need, you need a solid business plan, but they're quite functional. And, you know, I think you can get other people to help you with that. You, you lead with the vision, and I think that's the, the secret source. So some of the best leaders I've worked for, and, you know, I've been really lucky to just sort of sit in the same room and then really observe the questions that they ask, the things that they don't ask. But some of the key qualities that I've seen are that they've been really decisive. So they're very comfortable with making decisions with imperfect information and, and also comfortable with knowing that sometimes they might not be the right decisions. They've asked lots of questions. So there's less ego there, really. They're much more focused on understanding what's going on and making sure that they understand what's going on. And so they, they will ask really simple questions if needed to clarify their understanding and they really aren't that concerned with appearing to be the cleverest person in the room and you know going hand in hand with that they're very honest about what they don't know you know they've got certain skill sets and and they are very talented in those but they don't know everything and they know that and uh, they're really, really quick to identify those bits that they don't know but crucially they they know people that can give them the answer really quickly and that lack of ego means that they don't waste time putting on a facade and, and pretending that they know what's going on. Instead, they're able to act much quicker and get things done much quicker. And then finally, you know, flexibility and adaptability. There are far too many variables to have a handle on. And so whilst you might have a vision, you need to be flexible about how it how you get there because you never know. There might be a global pandemic that happens or 
you might be going through a divorce or you have a loved one that passes away, things that are kind of out of your control that affect your business are going to happen. So you need to be able to flex and adapt accordingly. Brilliant. No, that makes a huge amount of sense. I think in, again, such a sort of bubbly, volatile, early stage market, being flexible is key and, and egos, I think we, we've all seen it, can get in the way quite easily and stop actual productivity and, and effective businesses being run. And is a shame to see it, particularly from the outside, because it can seem very obvious. But I, I think it's a, a slippery slope, but really, really useful advice. And any advice, Anuj, and this is really for just a little short caveat to this. A lot of the time I speak to candidates, so Anuj mentions I speak to a lot of candidates a day, we speak to a lot of businesses a day, and a lot of people are trying to figure out what's going on in the cannabis industry. And obviously the cannabis conversation is a really useful resource for them. So one of the first things we do is send anyone that is looking to find out about the cannabis industry to the Cannabis Conversation podcast. But Anuj, directly for all the candidates that I'm about to send this podcast, do you have any best advice for less for entrepreneurs, more people, any sort of person from different traditional backgrounds that are looking to get involved in the cannabis sector, but may not have a huge amount of information on it? Yeah, really good question. So obviously listen to some old podcasts and, and there are lots of other ones as well, which shows really useful. I, I, the reason I was drawn to podcasts was it's quite a good passive way to take in information while you're going for a walk or you're going for a run or you're at the gym or something like that when, when we're allowed to go to the gym. So yeah, podcasts are really useful, uh, not just mine. <laughs> Reading, I mean, some of the sites that I really like are Project CBD and Kenigma. And those two are, I guess, a bit more on the medical side, but they've got some great sort of guides and basics. And then MJ Biz Daily, I think is is great on the sort of business front. Although unfortunately, our, our friend Alfredo has just, just announced that he's moving on from the European kind of editor bit. So that's a great shame. But yeah, no, MJ Biz is, is great for sort of more of the business side of things. And when we're allowed to go to some conferences, I mean, there's lots of web conferences, although, you know, I think everyone's a little bit zoomed out, aren't they? But yeah, face-to-face -face conferences are great, you know, and you can really just talk to people and ask lots of questions, really. I mean, it's refreshing when people just ask questions because there's lots of people that like answering the questions. So don't be afraid. Brilliant. And I mean, I guess back in the day, and I really do feel, I say back in the day, when we used to go to these conferences, and I, I do miss the networking element of it. And normally, if you wanted to get hold of Anuj, you go and find him and he's interviewing someone interesting. But now we're in the digital area. How do people get hold of you if they want to get in touch or hear more about your consultancy work? Or what do they do? So on LinkedIn, I'm probably the main platform for me. Happy to say that Cannabis Conversation has over 11,000 followers now, which is really great to have that many people sort of enthusiastic about it. So, yeah, come find me on there. And and the new website is at www.canverse.global. And, yeah, feel free to drop me a line through that. And um, that's also got all the podcasts on it as well. So, yeah, get, get in touch with me there. And I'd love to speak to you about kind of any project in this space, I think. it's There's so much different stuff happening. It's, it's, it's never a dull day. Amazing. Thanks again, Anuj. And a big thank you for having me on and giving me the opportunity to uh, interview you for your 100th episode. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I really hope that, that all the listeners do as well. Yeah, no, thank you. No, Tom, seriously, thank you very much for uh, suggesting it and volunteering. And why don't you actually tell people a bit about where they can find you? Before I do hand over to you, I can highly re recommend Tom as one of the most connected people in the European space, certainly and full of amazing advice. So yeah, please do get in touch with him. Tom, how do they do that? So LinkedIn as well. So we, we've recently changed, and thank you, Anuj, recently changed our, our name from uh, Bloom Jobs to Lumino. So you can find us on LinkedIn at Lumino or www.lumino.com. You can also connect with me directly on LinkedIn, Thomas Gray, and I'm always happy to have a chat, be it candidate or client. Yeah, that's how you get in touch. Great stuff. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate this. And I guess here's to another 100 episodes. <laughs> I look forward to interviewing you for your 200th. Maybe, or maybe Joe Rogan will, I'll let him have a, have a shot this time. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.